Hi, welcome to Live on KEXP at Home. I'm Cheryl Waters. So delighted to be here today. It's always fun to do these sessions. We're reimagining what live music looks like at KEXP these days. And I think we got the hang of it. We've had so many friends stop by and it's really fun to have so many listeners from around the world included in these sessions. I appreciate you joining us and really appreciate all the KEXP donors who support this public radio station, which is a worldwide arts organization, making these kind of sessions possible. And boy, did we really get an incredible guest to join me today. Please welcome Lucinda Williams, live on KEXP at home. Hi, Lucinda. Hi. It is so wonderful to see you. I last saw you at Marymore Park a couple of summers ago out here in Seattle. And yeah. Whenever you play here, I've actually seen you play at Marymore twice. Uh, it was 2010, I think, was the time before that. And uh, you play so wonderfully and seem so happy. I'm sure you're like that, <laughs> Joe, but I feel like Seattle's your favorite place to play. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of them, yeah, definitely. Well, we're so happy to have you join us here. Thank today. you. Um, your new album, Good Souls, Better Angels, is so wonderful. It's so powerful. I feel like it's just gritty and confident. It's angry. It's compassionate. It's easily one of the best albums of the year. And you've been releasing one incredible record after another for over 40 years, which just <laughs> boggles the mind. <laughs> On your yeah. website, you say it's all come first full circle. What do you mean by that? Um, you mean regarding the new album? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the conversation was at the time, but, uh, what did I mean by that? <laughs> what you thought, right? um, well, you've certainly covered a lot of ground throughout. I think that maybe I was referring to, or, you know, everybody says, oh, you've got all these protest songs and everything. Um, on this album, and uh, um, I actually refer to, I like to refer to them as, um, you know, songs of social unrest. And uh, that's what I, I guess I meant um, that, you know, this album kind of represents a circle in a way because I started singing protest songs, you know, back in the sixties and everything. And um, I've always wanted to make an album like this. I mean, I, I was in a, when I was in the writing mode, the, you know, the stuff that I'm singing about on this album was at the forefront of my mind, which shouldn't be too surprising to everybody because <laughs> we're all feeling this right now. So um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I answered that question right. I'm, no, I'm, absolutely. Well, you talked about um, singing protest songs early, and you were yeah. protesting injustice when you were very young as a teenager. Yeah, I'm yeah when I was in high school. What What was your childhood like? It sounds like you grew up in a house where you were encouraged to form your own opinion. Yes, I was. Well, you know, my dad was a published poet. He taught creative writing. Um, we, we lived in college towns, you know, so, um, I was lucky because I was able to grow up around, um, you know, very bright people, thinkers, you know, and, um, my dad had his own experience with, uh, civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement before I was born, um, he became best friends with George Haley, who was the brother of Alex Haley. He wrote Roots. And George Haley was the first black student at the University of Arkansas. And he and my dad got to be really good friends. And then George Haley became my godfather after I was born in 53. And um, my father's father was the CO, conscientious objector in World War I, which was unheard of. And he was part of the Southern, tenor, Southern Farmers Tenant Union struggle. Um, so, you know, my dad referred to my grandfather as a socialist Democrat. So, you know, that I come from a long line of people like that. There must have been some incredible conversations around the dinner table when you were growing. Yeah. <laughs> 
you have moved from Los Angeles, where you live for quite a long time, back to Nashville, which is where you are right now. And mm -hmm. in fact, it was right before the pandemic forced us all yeah. to hunker down. I imagine things are a little different in Nashville now in more than one way. How's it been moving back? Um, it's been great. You know, we were, my husband and manager, Tom and I were starting to spend more and more time here. Um, in between tours, usually we'd end up in Nashville because that's where all the tour buses live, <laughs> you know, so the tour would end up here. We have a couple of weeks off and rather than go all the way back to LA, I just, you know, we would just hang out in town at the Lowe's hotel <laughs> that became our second home. <laughs> and, um, you know, after a while, several of the people I've worked with now are based out of here. Or, you know, after a while, we just said, well, we should get a place here, you know, because you can't afford to keep staying at the, <laughs> at the Lowe's Hotel. So we started looking around and we found a cool place that was affordable because we still have our house in L.A. So um, right now. So we found a place in Lachlan Springs in East Nashville. And. Turns out we so many people we know live right in the neighborhood, and it's just so much easier to get things done here because it's a smaller city, and it's easier to travel in and out of here. Like, you know, it's an hour to fly to New York, and you know that kind of thing. I mean, I love LA, you know, but just wasn't really working anymore. Yeah, I like being centrally located better. Even have, though I, lo I love the Southwest, but, you know, it's just easier. <laughs> you moved at a very auspicious time right before the pandemic. And I know that yeah. tornado hit Nashville and some storms hit it right after you moved. Yeah. Um, have you been able to reconnect or build a community there? Well, then? yeah, because, I mean, you know, we've, we have the circle of people we work with and, um, you know, so, you know, we see a few people safely, um, but I mean, we haven't been out, out to any, you know, functions or anything. It's just, the only time I've even been out of the house is just to go to the Ray Kennedy studio to do some sessions like we did for this thing. <laughs> and um, that's where we recorded my album. And so we go, we've been, I've been over there a few times to do some recording um, and that really helps you know, just to be able to do those music things, um, you know, is really good. But other than that, I mean, we get groceries delivered, dinner delivered. <laughs> we live right next door to a, a frothy monkey. <laughs> What's that? Which is great. It's an independently run coffee chain um, that also serves sandwiches and things and, you know. Sounds delicious. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Lucky. Well, you mentioned <laughs> the studio that you've been going to. You were kind enough to uh, put together some exclusive KEXP songs for us uh, from the new album, Good Souls, mm -hmm. Better Angels. And we're going to listen to a couple of those now. Okay. Let's listen to Williams live on KEXP. Hey, at it's Lucinda Williams. And I'm here with Stuart Mathis on guitar. And uh, we're going to be doing some songs. Uh, for KEXP Radio, happy to be here. This is called You Can't Rule Me. Your man, I got a right. To talk about what I see Way too much is going wrong And it's right in front of me You can't rule me You can't rule me You can't take my money And try to rule me too You might expect me to follow But I ain't gonna fall in line I tell you what, this much I know The dotted line ain't been signed You can't rule me You can't rule me You can't take my 
my soul and try to rule me too. You might beat me, you might cheat me, and try to make me change my mind. You might stick me, you might trick me. I'm gonna tell you one last time you can't rule me. You can't rule me. You can't take my money and try to rule me too. All right, so play the blues. Good for me. You won't tell me what I'm paying for. The game is fixed, it's plain to see. But I ain't playing no more. You can't rule me. You can't rule me. You can't take my money and try to rule me too. This is called Man Without a Soul. Darkness all around you to c 
cover all your hiding There's no light in your eyes You're a man without a soul Now the exits will be closing The sad life will be exposed No dealer and no deals You're a man without a soul How do you think this story ends? It's not a matter of how It's just a matter of when Cause it's coming down Yeah, it's coming down That was amazing. <laughs> You're listening to Listen to Williams Live on KEXP at Home. Songs from the new album, Good Souls, Better Angels. It came out in April. That was "Can't You Can't Rule Me. And that last one there, Man Without a Soul. And your good friend, Stuart Mathis, uh, yes. was performing there with you. And is that the studio where you recorded yeah. the record? Yeah, that's Roy Kennedy's studio. Yeah. Tell me about making the record. You recorded it there in Nashville. And I know you were out on a big tour for the Car Wheels on a Gravel mm -hmm. Road anniversary. And uh, I think I read in some interviews that you pretty much started making the record not too long after you landed yeah. um, from that. Well, tour. we were, we kind of started, you know, in between tours. Um, yeah, Ray kept, we never had really a formal, you know, plan. Um, to go in and do a whole album with Ray Kennedy at his studio. It was just more, um, you know, we every time we were in Nashville, we'd run into him, and he would say, you know, you need to come in the studio and check it out, because we'd never seen his new place. Um, you know, Ray is who I worked with on the Carvels album uh, with Steve Earle, and the studio is called Room and Board, and um, it was off of Music Row back then, and so... This is where Steve is. I mean, this is where Ray's working now. Um, so anyway, we had some time in between runs, and uh, we kept, you know, the rest of the – Stuart lives here in Nashville. Um, Butch, the drummer, David, the bass player, both live in L.A. So they stayed over a few days. I had a handful of songs ready, and um, we went in just to kind of – you know, see what would happen kind of thing. And the magic happened. <laughs> and I think the first thing we cut was, you can't rule me. And, um, you know, Ray just, I can't say enough about his expertise as an engineer. I mean, first of all, he's got, you walk in the studio and he's got a wall or a couple of walls covered with vintage guitars, very valuable vintage guitars, um, and vintage amplifiers. So I would be on, you know, usually on one of those guitars going through a 1950s amp. So that helped give it a certain sound. And he just knew what to do to get this grungy garage rock punky sound that I was going for that fit with these songs, you know, and, um, 
So we all we knew we were onto something, you know. So we just uh, we cut the whole this whole album in not straight over fourteen days, but I think that those were the that was the number of uh, tracking days. And That's you know we were still touring too. So um, and we didn't have you know a bunch of overdubs and stuff. So that saved a lot of time too. And we didn't want really. We decided not to. Um, and just leave it like it was, you know. Car Wheels came out yeah. in 98. And was the experience working with Ray just sort of like riding a bike? Is like getting right back on? I mean, uh, I could, yeah. It sounds, like it was, it sounds like it was a very different experience than the main. Yeah, it was a different experience, completely different. Because it was just Ray and the band and me and Tom. And, you know, um, yeah, I think he just instinctively knew kind of what to do, you know. Um, it sounds very organic. Yeah, it's, yeah, it was a very organic process. Yeah. It sounds like you and your husband, Tom, have an incredible partnership. I know he worked on this record with you, your partners, um, in many mm -hmm. ways, um, and especially through music and, well, maybe not especially, especially in, in your life, but it must be so amazing to have a relationship with someone that you can create with. Tell me about the way that you yeah. work together. Um, well, you know, before, when Tom and I first met, he was working for Fontana, uh, which is a distribution company, which is part of, was part of Universal Music Group. And so he spent years, you know, doing A&R and marketing and, and all that at record labels. And, um, so, you know, he brings a lot to the table, you know, as a manager <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he took over management because it just makes made sense. Um, and I used to work with Frank Calari, and he wasn't doing well health wise, and um, he actually passed away some years ago. And so, you know, Tom was looking for a career change, and we'd already been kind of you know putting ideas together and stuff. So it just made sense. He had to get past my. Booking agent Frank Riley first, who I've who's been with me from since the Rough Trade album, and wow. my my attorney <laughs> Rosemary Carroll, uh, but they both just you know adore Tom, and uh, he passed the test with flying colors, so you know it works. It, it, it it's not for everybody, uh, but it works for us. I love how you surround yourself with people that you've been working with for a really long time. Yeah. It must be, you know, good to feel like you have people around you that you trust. And yeah, it is. It's a, it makes a huge difference. It's just, you know, it's like night and day, really. And that's how it feels like a, a little family, you know. You and Tom also work on some of the songs together. And you mm -hmm. haven't done that throughout you know, your entire career. I know you've tried to collaborate with people from time to time, but I think of you yeah. as a solitary songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been easier for me. Um, I mean, I guess cause my songs are so personal and everything and you know, well, how does it work? They, with Tom? What's the, what's well, the um, I didn't, a little did I know he was, you know, very interested in creative writing. Um, and he was, he had already been, you know, exploring that just on his own silently. <laughs> and then he, he started feeling brave enough to, you know, show me some ideas that he had some lines and uh, ideas for songs. And he would always say, now you don't have to use, use them, but I just wanted to show you, you know, just to see what you thought. And, you know, and um, so it kind of started like that. And I think the first song that he really had the what had a major part in as far as the idea was uh, um, Ghost of Highway 20. And um, so, you know, that it, it's, it has, usually it's about him bringing me an idea and a couple of lines or, you know, something like that. And then I sit down and start messing around with it. At first, I'm not. I, I haven't always been, you know, open to all his ideas. But like Big Black Train was his 
that was his. He brought that to me. And I said, now, <laughs> the first thing I said was, what in the world am I going to write about as far as, you know, a big black train that hasn't been said in the last, you know, 200 years? <laughs> what do you say to that? And he said, well, you know, it's the way I'm looking at it is like a black cloud, like in the cloud of depression. And I said, okay, let me, let me see what I could do. And I started digging into it. And I, I think it was probably when I got a melody and then it just kind of all clicked. It's hard to explain. Um, but I and now, now that song makes me cry almost every time I do it. Oh. It's something about it. It's very haunting. So anyway, I, I open myself up to the idea of collaborating. Because um, it works in this regard. You know, I don't know if I could. I, there's a different thing that goes on in Nashville as far as the co-writing thing goes, which I don't think I'd be real comfortable with. You know, which is more like you make an appointment, sit down with, you know, oftentimes two or three people, um, which I can't really see doing. And writing a song from scratch, you know, where everybody contributes lines and stuff. But I'm not. Every, it's everybody's different, you know. I'm not a songwriter myself, but sometimes I'll see maybe even 10 names. Four or five different. Yeah, me too. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> work. What I know. <laughs> well, I love yeah. that, that he was uh got brave enough to bring a song to you because you know mm -hmm. I know you're married, but you're <laughs> yeah, William. <laughs> That's gotta be yeah, <laughs> That's sweet. It I is sweet. Well, you know, I look at it as kind of like um Tom Waits and his wife Kathleen. You know, because um they started collaborating. And so, you know, I felt okay about it when I thought about them. Yeah, that's not bad. That. Not bad. Yeah. Up. It's exciting to see you exploring new themes on your records. You mix it up all the time. And I never know what I'm going to get on a new Listen to Williams record. Um, you've gotten very confrontational on Good Souls, Better Angels. Or, you know, as I say that, I realize it's just de confrontational in a different way because you've always right. been yeah. opening my mind to new ideas, but it makes me wonder where the songs come from. If you sit down and write where your headspace is at right before a record and all the songs come from one space, or do you keep a yeah. journal or a music notebook? Do you go back mm -hmm. to fragments of unfinished songs? How does a song or, or a record come together? All all of the above, or, you know, either each one and all of the above, you know, like some of them are, you know, brand new songs that I was work, you know, that I did right before we go, went into the studio. Um, but more often than not, there, I have pieces of songs from songs that I've been, it could take a, a few years sometimes to get a song fit for some, whatever reason, I'll have a little piece of it. Um, and I can't seem to get, get it done, and, but I save everything and I keep a, I keep a briefcase with everything filed in it, you know, um, cause I have so many things I'm working on at the same time. So, but like one of these songs, uh, Bone of Contention, that I actually wrote that and recorded it during the, uh, the West or Little Honey album or West album. Oh, wow. And it just never, yeah. And, you know, it's kind of on the shelf. And then Tom, remember, you know, he said, wait a minute, bone of contention. That's perfect for this album. And so we re recorded a new version of it. And it sounds like I could have written it yesterday. So sometimes that'll happen. So it's kind of just a, it's a mixture of all those things, you know. But, yeah, don't. I never throw anything away <laughs> <That's> <laughs> until I've learned until I've used it in a song. You know, keep everything. So you mentioned that it sounds something that you know that that album West came out in two thousand seven. So presumably you were working on those songs even before that. So that's fifteen some odd yeah. years. Yeah, and you say it fits perfectly right now. I mean, even though Good Souls Better Angels was written and recorded before COVID nineteen pandemic, the songs feel very time to, yeah. to today well i think the pandemic kind of in a strange way reflects 
you know, what's been going on in, in the government and, you know, all the abuses and um, unfairness that, you know, people have been experiencing, you know, for some time now. It, in, in a strange way, it's just all, you know, um, very sort of, uh, you know, apocalyptic. I'm sure you've heard people say that before, you know. Yeah. Um, well, the first two songs that you, you played, the uh, You Can't Rule Me and Man Without a Soul, I mean. The, yeah. <laughs> that's just right there in front of you, <laughs> black and white. <laughs> yeah. Um, the new album, Good Souls, Better Angels. Should we, shall we play a couple more songs? Sure. All righty. Here's Lucinda. I didn't know I was being, I just looked at this corner of the screen. It said, you're in the show. Everyone could see and hear you. <laughs> oh yeah. Did you know? We're, we're, we're around the world. Um, okay. Well, I didn't know they could see me. I mean, when on the, when we play. Oh no. When, when we show me playing. No, when we show you, okay, you, good. They can just be you and Stuart, so you can scratch okay. your or whatever you want to do. Then, okay. <laughs> yes. Now we're going to go uh, to you and Stuart Mathis. Uh, it's Lucinda Williams live on KEXP at home. This is called "Pray the Devil Back to Hell." <laughs> Inside the dark Behind these walls Yeah, inside the dark Behind these walls There used to be a spark But now the devil calls And so I run somewhere I can have my strength So I run somewhere I can hide my shame But I swear I hear him call my name He says come to me Let's play some more Says, come to me, let's play some more. You wait, you see what I've got in store. Now, all my fears have finally begun. Now, all my fears. Finally be gone Through all my tears I come undone At the end of the day There's nobody else At the end of the day There's nobody else Nobody can save you from yourself and Can't you hear him calling, calling your name? Can't you hear him calling, calling your name? He ain't gonna spare you only
I'm gonna have to pray the devil back to hell. I'm gonna pray the devil back to hell. Yeah, I'm gonna pray the devil back to hell. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pray. The devil back to hell Yeah, I'm gonna have to pray The devil back to hell Yeah, I'm gonna pray The devil back to hell Yeah, I'm gonna pray The devil back to hell I'm gonna pray the devil back to hell. Yeah, I'm gonna pray the devil back to hell. Yeah, oh, I'm gonna pray the devil back to hell. This is called When the Way Gets Dark. This goes out to all of y'all out there. Uh, just to say, you know, hang in there, this too shall pass. It's dark You lose your spirit Will you lose your heart When the way gets dark Will you lose your fight Will you lose your spark Don't give up Hang on tight Don't be afraid Don't give up It's gonna be alright be okay When the way gets dark We lose yourself We lose it all When the way gets dark we lose your balance, you stumble and fall Don't give up, you have a reason to carry on Don't give up, take my hand, you're never It's dark We lose your spirit We lose your heart When the way gets dark We lose the fight We lose your spark Don't give up Hang on tight Don't be afraid Don't give up It's gonna be alright You're gonna be Never 
Oh, that one's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Brings a tear to my Thank eye. You. We've got listeners uh, watching from all over the world. And Jacques wrote, this song came at the perfect moment for me. Just hearing Lucinda sing, don't give up. Everything will be okay. Gives me hope. Oh. <laughs> well, I feel I- that way. You know, it's going to be okay. We just have to fight harder. <laughs> Everybody's got to get to the polls. No excuses. <sighs> Absolutely. You know, in interviews, you've discussed the influence of 60s and 70s protest songs on your music. And we're living through such an inspiring movement right now as folks are taken to the streets for Black Lives Matter. And I feel that the power of a good protest song is in its ability to be applied to various types of oppression and oppressors. And you've done that with a number of songs on this record. I mean, just off the top of my head, because you performed it for us today, Man Without a Soul certainly has the potential for that kind of longevity. It's such an incredible song. Can you tell me about how that or some of these other songs came yeah. together that feel very well, timely again, to us right now? I have to give credit to Tom. Uh, Man Without a Soul, um, he he came up with that line and um, just, you know, was encouraging me to, you know, write a song around that. And um, to be honest, at first I said, well, you know, everybody has a soul. And it reminded me of the Neil Young song when he sings, you know, even Richard Nixon has got soul. <laughs> Um, and I wasn't sure about it at first, but, you know, just Tom really leaned on this one. He was just, this was, a this was something that he just said, we, this has got to be written. We, it has to come out man without a soul. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be about the president, but of course, you know, um, <laughs> that's who I was thinking of, but, you know, um, I've had some people who have been offended, uh, you know, but um, anyway, so I fought this one a little bit. I don't know why. Um, I just uh, wasn't sure, and but it got written, you know, so, um, yeah, and That's people have really, uh, I've gotten all kinds of response. Most, the majority of them have been good, you know. Um, but you know, God, there are so many, I mean, people are really overly sensitive these days, you know, I mean, the stuff that, you know, I was, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a Joe Strummer song for a Joe Strummer tribute benefit album, um, that Jesse Mallon's putting together. And, you know, I'm looking at his songs thinking, Big deal. I mean, I've wrote a song called Man Without a Soul. I mean, it's people are just so timid these days. And I look at Joe Strummer's material, I think, well, you know, what would people say about that now if that was being written now? You know, and uh, where is all the rebellion in rock? You know, where is it? I don't know. I guess it's more in the hip hop world. Um, Cause I mean, it's just the making that big of a deal over the, it's like, Ooh, what I said something bad. I mean, you know, you stood so, for your convictions. I, I know, but it shouldn't be that. Why is that such a big deal <laughs> or so hard to do? I mean, it's, I'm not, I know I'm not alone in this, in this fight, but you know, yeah. Anyway, it's just, you know, somebody, there's a comment on, you know, um, somebody said I wasn't compassionate because I've written that song, you know, that I was a compassionate person. I'm, I'm compassionate. I wrote these songs because I care. I mean, where the, it's, you know, it's just ridiculous. It's, Everything's so PC now. Everybody's walking on eggshells. I mean, get over it, you know. Well, and also. Sorry, but <laughs> just, you know. People don't even have to think about what they say anymore. I mean, the way that people can respond on 
in real time and in social media and just fire something off without putting a face yeah. behind it. I mean, it wasn't like that. 20 Maybe that's what ago. it was. Yeah. It came out of the music. You didn't have the social media thing. People had time to sit with it as well. I mean, I yeah. that when you talk about how Tom had to push you um, on parts of this song. And I really think that sounds incredibly rewarding the way you work together on music. You yeah. Know, he, he put a germ of an idea in your mind right? and you had to sit with it. And I'm mm -hmm. sure, sure you didn't feel the pressure to, to, to do it. If you didn't but it's want a good it. kind of pressure, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it but, yeah. 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 Think in a different way than you would think if you were pondering mm -hmm. it on your own with your. Absolutely. Yeah. Notes. It just opens up, you know, having him bring different ideas. It just, you know, opens up a whole, you know, different world of possibilities. Well, um, I know this is an incredibly sensitive topic, but another powerful song is Waking Up. And you've talked yeah. openly about that song. And it's about your experience with domestic abuse. And mm -hmm. I imagine it must mean a lot to other people who have had a similar experience. Yeah. What's the response to that song been like? You know, it's interesting. I have, that's the one, that's the song I expected to get more, um, uh, crazy feedback on you know like if anybody's gonna be bothered by a song i thought that would have been the one um because i really felt like when after i wrote and then recorded that song i mean i loved it i loved the way it came out and you know i knew i was kind of crossing a line um as far as my songwriting you know the lyrics and everything are pretty right in your face um it's all very literal, you know, but I haven't really, I mean, I've talked about it in interviews a couple of times. People have brought it up, um, but, you know, it's been positive for the most part as far as the response. Man Without a Soul is the one that has been getting all the, you know, crazy negative responses. But, yeah, Waking Up is, a, you know, needed to be written. Um, I, I imagine when you start playing that out on tour, I mean, that's yeah, <laughs> going to really be hitting people. I think that's going to really speak to a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something, you know, I wrote from my own experience, you know, personal, unfortunately, you know, I used to think, oh, I'll never let myself get in, <laughs> get in that kind of situation. Well, you know. It can happen to anybody. Um, and, uh, you know, it was I was with this guy who was sober when I met him. Uh, it was actually he was in a, he was in a halfway house. And uh, the first lesson is don't, if somebody's at a halfway house or rehab center, they're there for a reason, you know. <laughs> they need to finish going through their thing. You know, they don't move out. But that's what happened. This guy moved out of his sober living house in with me and then he you know started drinking again and whiskey was his choice his pick of poison you know and then it was he was like dr jekyll and mr hyde you know you probably heard that happen it was just some kind of chemical thing would happen and he would just go off you know he did pull a chair out from under me <laughs> <laughs> and some other things, you know. So anyway, um, I actually wrote about him two other songs that weren't as heavy as this. But the first one was Jailhouse Tears, which is kind of a comical look at it. And then this song called Buttercup. That's about the same guy. But um, And were you telling yourself, I need to be, be more outspoken about this more clear it just I'm trying came to out you know like and I, I i am into some hip-hop artists too you know i listen to a lot of different kinds of stuff um and you know i kind of felt like 
Well, I mean, there was a fine line between, you know, beat the, the beat poetry, um, like Gil Scott Heron did and some of the hip hop stuff, you know. Um, so it kind of has that, that little bit of angle to, you know, to it. But our, you know, the really cool thing was after we recorded it, I had somebody over at the studio who's a real famous musician <laughs> and, um, you know, I was asking him about that song and he said he didn't think I should put it on the album. Mm -hmm. Um, that I should put it, you know, release it as a sing or you know, B side of something. But then, so then I got all insecure about it, but then the guys in the band and Tom and Ray, you know, they all, they all stood up for me and they all said, Lou, you got to put that on the album. It needs to be there. So. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you did. I mean, you are the dictionary definition of an influential songwriter. <laughs> You've written music that has inspired you. for so many decades now. And I feel like it's becoming even more apparent as more musicians who grew up listening to your records are stepping into the spotlight. Just off the top of my head is Katie Crutchfield of Waxahachie. She cited oh, you yeah. as <laughs> primary influence on her latest record, St. Cloud, which is amazing. Yeah. Another one of the great ones of 2020. What's the experience like for you seeing your musical style woven through the art of talented young musicians <laughs> like that? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, it's such a compliment and it's humbling and, um, you know, sometimes I don't see it because, you know, they'll say certain people, someone's music kind of reminds them of my music and I'll listen and think, I don't know what, you know, um, but I mean, it's great. You know, I just, I don't really, I keep forgetting. <laughs> I forget how old I am sometimes, <laughs> you know, Ditto. <laughs> um, but you know, cause I'm, I don't know. I, my dad used to say, well, you know, Lee Williams is mature, slow, or slow to mature, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty young at heart. I mean, I never had kids or anything. And, you know, my whole music has just been it for me. So, you know, I don't, there's not a big, real, you know, uh, vast, area really between you know some of these other artists who are in their 20s and 30s and you know yeah it doesn't really i'm not really conscious of it all the time you know so but anyway to answer your question yes it's wonderful and it's always a great compliment especially when somebody covers one of my songs i mean that's always you know the ultimate compliment for a songwriter well, I remember when Mary Chapin Carpenter covered you way back yeah. in the 80s. And uh, I, I remember when that song came out. Yeah. That's about the time I discovered you. And that was very exciting. And she opened a big door for me. That there was the kind of a funny story behind that. She had been performing that song live and uh, recorded it. She wanted it to be the first single off her album. And her record company people said, because at that time, she was still being marketed out of Nashville as a country artist. Um, and they said, no, we don't think it's a good idea to release Passion Kisses as a single. And she said, why not? They said, because it's not country enough. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, to, to hell with that. You know, I want it to be the first single. So she stood her ground and you know, they relented and it came out and then it won a Grammy for Country Song of the Year, <laughs> which surprised the hell out of me. And I'm sure everybody else on Music Row. Um, but I, it's funny I, how those things happen, you know. I love that story, especially since I hear from so many of my indie music friends um, that they say that you you taught them that it was okay to like country music. <laughs> well, I grew up listening. I love country music, but I don't like a lot of the new stuff. But, you know, I love Hank and Hank Williams and Merle Haggard and Waylon and Loretta and Tammy. You know, that's the stuff I grew up on. 
Um, but I mean, I, I still get called country. I don't know. I, it's, I think people just, everything's got to be, you know, kind of put in a box. Like that, I've, nobody's ever been able to figure out what, <laughs> where I fit in. You know, it's, my music has always fallen in the cracks between country and rock. You know, well, that so. made it hard for you, um, you know, yeah, because nobody, you know, when it when radio airplay was yeah. vital to kind mm -hmm. of financial success, they didn't know where to put your. They did, they literally didn't. They didn't have a market for it, you know. So, um, yeah. But you persevered. So that. <laughs> well, yeah, I did because I had to, and that was all I had. I mean, you know, my music was is the, it was and has been and is the focal point in my life. So, yeah. Well, for as many people as you've influenced, there have been so many influential people in your life. And as much as it's a, a, an honor for someone to cover you, you have um, covered some people and you shared a mm -hmm. cover with us today. I think you introduced it in the clip. Shall we just? Yeah. Okay. Listen to Williams live. Well, okay. it's been a, uh... Nice playing for y'all today. Again, the Stuart Mathis on guitar. We're gonna end with a J.J. Kale song that we love called Magnolia.
at home oh you and Stuart sounds so wonderful <laughs> he's great oh thank you for doing it. he is he plays violin on the new record too doesn't he um yeah a little bit a little bit yeah I saw that in the liner it's all that in the liner notes <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh someone is asking what it says on your t-shirt in that recording session not the one you oh wrote. it says uh, file under rock. It's a new t-shirt that we're, we've just made up that we're doing for, uh, to sell on the website and everything. So yeah, Tom asked me to wear it that day. <laughs> I love it. Um, I want to talk about that song Magnolia. Um, cause that's a, some a, what rare cover for you that appeared on your record or to have a cover appear on a record it was on your double album down where the spirit meets the bone which came out mm -hmm. in 2014 you did a 10 minute version of it there yeah and, i mean jj i mean what a beautiful song that is that came out on yeah. his two album naturally but what about that song speaks to you it must be so fun to reimagine and pour your heart into a song yeah that you I love it. I love, you know, covering somebody else's song and it, it's important to me, you know, the lyrics are important and the melody, I have to really be able to dig into it, get behind it and everything. So, you know, um, there aren't that many that I feel good about, you know, that I feel like I can really do justice to, you know, um, but there are certain ones that are so great to do and fun to do because I feel like I could really interpret them like that one. Um, it's just so open, has so much space. And, you know, there's just a beautiful melody and it just, it kind of lulls you, you know, it just kind of, uh, it just feels good to sing it and listen well, to it. Perfect and word there. I feel like when yes. you yeah. I could see myself in my frame. I was kind of. Sweating. I know, me too. I was just kind of, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, Lucinda, yes. it's been such a pleasure to oh, talk. Oh, thanks. You, you too. So many of the comments are saying, please do more of these, Lucinda. <laughs> we love you. And you are so beloved. And the new record, Good Soul, Better Angels. Thank you so much. For Thank that. you for having me. It's, it's been, been a pleasure. So Thanks to all of our viewers today for joining us and supporting KEXP. You can find out more about us on our website at kexp.org and uh, see a schedule of more of these upcoming sessions. And uh, I think you knocked it out of the park today. Lucinda, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.